Yes. So, again, today we'll be talking about quite a few quite interesting things, but before we go, I'll just briefly I'll give you a little background. My name is Jan Kolbusz. I come from Poland. In Poland, my dad and his partner, long time, long -time friend, they started Probiotics Polska. And Probiotics Polska uh, SCD, I mean, is uh, SCD's, exclusive, SCD's licensing in Poland. And those companies had a great relationship, and that relationship resulted in me coming to Kansas City back in 2010. For, first, I was an intern with SCD, and then I moved on to work on a research project, which happened to be my master's project. In there at the University of Missouri, Columbia, the, co the research project was in cooperation with SCD Probiotics and Probiotics Polska, and today I will be talking about key findings from that project. So just to give you a heads up on what we are going to go through today, I will explain to you a little about the research questions we are trying to answer in that project. Uh, those research questions kind of divided our project into two, some sort of separate studies, so I will go through those studies with you. Towards the end, I will try to summarize everything, and then at the end, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. So, so uh, agriculture continues to be a big market for probiotics. There's a bunch of good things we could do with, uh, with probiotics right there. And in our project, we were interested in trying to, in, we were interested in understanding why probiotics work when they work in the field. What are the principles underlying the efficacy? So. Instead of just you know applying probiotics to plant A, B, and C, and seeing whether there's, there's yield increase, we are trying to find some more universal questions, answers to questions, why it works, when it works. So as you may know, probiotics can be used for, can deliver improved yields, and uh, at the same time, probiotics are known to control pathogens. And those, and in our study, in our research project, we are trying to understand better why this happens. And let's now go through this, starting from study one improved yields. In our study, we hypothesized, okay, we already know that probiotics can improve yields, and we hypothesized that maybe it is because probiotics do something good for the soil. Probiotics enhance soil microbial diversity. So why soil microbial diversity? Why focus on that? Well, plants grow in the soil, and in order to grow, plants require a certain level of biological activity in the soil. And microorganisms drive as much as 90% of all biological processes going on there in the soil. And what are these processes? Well, they release nutrients that can be then captured by plants. They enhance water uh, accessibility to plants. They also remove toxins. And um, in order to be effective with this, uh, microorganisms, so microorganisms, they require, I mean, um, they, ha they require a certain level of diversity. Like companies, for example, when they want to tackle certain, certain uh, challenges, what do they do? They brainstorm, they get new people on board, and with new skill sets, you know, new networking, they can, they can tackle the problems more effectively. And similar principles apply to the microbial world. The more diverse they are, the more efficient they are. And this is, and this is basic fact of uh, agronomy, basic fact of soil science. For example, my advisor, Dr. Robert, Robert Kramer, and his colleague, Dr. Means, they were looking at how certain uh, practices affect soil microbial diversity in a long-term study. And over 10 years, they found that when agricultural practices were causing a decline in microbial diversity, plants responded with reduced yields, less biomass, and other symptoms of worsened quality. So this is just a longer way of saying that there is re a relationship between soil microbial diversity and plant health, such that when there is a decline in soil microbial diversity, the reduced health, reduced plant quality follows. Okay, so we so we thought that hey, maybe probiotics can maybe probiotics can enhance soil microbial diversity. How would that work? And we did that. We tested that. So the way we did that, we applied probiotics to the field in a fashion quite similar to what farmers would normally do. It was we did that back in 2012, and over eight months we were sampling the soil 11 times to reveal the soil microbial diversity. We use the method known as 16S DNA DGGE. Please let me not tell you the full name of that. Uh, the method was devised in uh, early 1990s, and for two decades now it has been used in similar studies. It is well, uh, it is well established method, and we decided to use that. So what this method allows you to do is basically look at how many different microbial groups can you find in the soil, and the idea is that the more microbial groups there are in the soil, the more diversity there is. And in our field study, what we found 
Well, probiotics had no impact on soil microbial diversity. So they didn't enhance, but at the same time, they were, you know, they were non-harmful. So what we can say, probiotics are non-harmful to soil microbial diversity. Maybe our hypotheses were wrong, or, you know, 2012 was a year with severe droughts, uh, high temperatures, not enough rainfall, these kinds of things always uh, add some variation to your, to your study. Who knows, it would be hard to answer right now. But luckily, we replicated this study in more controlled conditions, in more like a greenhouse. And this, uh, this item in the middle, this is a big soil sample, one of many, that we've taken from the field, transferred to the, the uh, greenhouse, and we replicated the study there, basically applying probiotics to one sample and not applying to the other sampling, to re and then sampling to reveal soil microbial diversity. And this is what we found. So green bars correspond to microbial diversity in control, blue to the, uh, to the treatment. And um, when you look at those bars, you may already see that there is some sort of microbial diversity decline going on, which I will point to you in just a second. And this is normal, because when you transfer the soil from the field to some sort of artificial setting, there is this transition shock. Some microbes just will not make it, and some of them will die off. But when you look at the, when you look at the trend lines more closely, what you see is the the reduction in control was more severe than in the treatment, which means probiotics preserve soil microbial diversity. A great result right there. Right there, we found that probiotics have potentially great impact, beneficial impact on soil microbial communities. So what does that mean? Well, what could that mean in a real world setting? In a real world setting, that could mean that application of probiotics is conducive to better yields, and this is kind of no-brainer to farmers who have been using probiotics. So we can take that and explain it better to them why probiotics work, but we could also take these findings um, and use them while communicating with prospective customers, communicating to them why probiotics work, what is so good about them, what can they do for the soil, and then for yields as well. So that would wrap up the study number one um, about soil microbial diversity and the links to improve yields. So now let's move to study number two, where we were looking at disease control uh, capacities of probiotics. And we know that probiotics can control the disease, and we hypothesize that probiotics control the disease because they uh, disactivate, uh, disrupt the communication between pathogens. So what is that all about? How many of you are familiar with the term quorum sensing? It basically, yeah. <laughs> so if not all the analogies, would be more than happy to go through this video. <laughs> so quorum sensing basically means figuring out whether there is enough or not enough. Pathogens, before they, before they cause a disease, they figure out whether there is enough of them in the environment to be efficient or not. So if a pathogen arrives at a niche, like for example, wounded leaf or cracked fruit, it shows up there, it proliferates, and initially, it's perfectly benign to the, plant, to the plant. It proliferates, proliferates, and at the same time, it figures out how many of other, how many other pathogens are there in the environment. And once they figure out there is enough of them, suddenly they go, uh, they start messing around, and this is when we see disease, reduce yields, reduce quality. And um, to act like that is quite essential for pathogens. If they didn't rely on quorum sensing, and for example, started causing a disease before they secure enough manpower, if you will, they could be easily wiped out by plant immunity response, they could be wiped out by other microbes. So it's very critical for microbes to communicate effectively, and because it is so critical for them, it is also a good target for disease control strategies. And by the way, this is a, no, this is a common knowledge. Quorum sensing has been discovered probably 40 years ago, and right now there's a bunch of scientists who look at quorum sensing and how to utilize this for disease control. So, when you want to control pathogens by means of controlling quorum sensing, what do, you, what, who, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? And this is your bad guy. This is who you want to get. This is an autoinducer. Autoinducer are signaling molecules that are used by pathogens. Pathogens essentially cannot see each other, but they can see the signaling mo the, the signaling molecules. They send signal, this autoinducers to the environment. Autoinducers accumulate, and the concentration of autoinducers gives microbes and pathogens an idea of how many of them are there in the environment. So if you could reduce the population, if you could degrade autoinducers, reduce their concentration, it would be like effect, it would be like telling pathogens, hey, there is not enough of you in the environment, so just don't mess around, don't mess around, don't mess around. And um, this is what we hypothesize, that 
probiotics, maybe they could degrade the autoinducers. How about that? Let's, let's check this. And we did that. So how do you go about this? You buy the autoinducers. They can be purchased from chemical suppliers. They come in the form of very expensive white powder. You mix this white powder with uh, probiotics you in or in water for control. You incubate the mixture for however long you want. We started with two hours, but then we moved up to eight hours. And then at the end, you analyze, the co you look at the concentration of autoinducers. And the idea is that if the concentration of autoinducers uh, is dropped, it means that probiotics degraded them. And for that, you use a method called gas chromatography mass spectrometry, also previously validated method. So we used a door that were already open for us. So we set up the first study, and this is what we found right there. Our hypothesis was correct. Probiotics nearly wiped out the autoinducers. So what does that mean? It means that probiotics synthesize uh, enzymes, and enzymes are biological tools that are designed for very specific functions, like, for example, deactivating autoinducers. Just as, I, for example, I can deactivate my phone by doing something like that, right? This is what probiotics did to autoinducers. And in this situation, pathogens will find it much harder to communicate, much harder to cause a disease. Quite an exciting finding. So once you come across something like that, what do you do next? Well, probably you would want to crack a champagne bottle open or something like that. But this is not what you do because you're a scientist, so you want more data, more charts, <laughs> more everything. And you replicate the study using more, using longer incubation, and suddenly we found no results. The same autoinducer, the same other culture, no results. Even, you see, even though there's, you may, those bars may seem slightly different to you, statistically speaking, they are the same. Probiotics were inefficient in degrading the autoinducer, and that was quite a puzzling finding to us. What's the, where is that coming from? And then we realized that for those studies, we used different, mother, different batches of mother cultures. So maybe there is some quality um, differences between batches that result in different autoinducer degrading profile. Who knows? If, or maybe we messed something up with handling, storage. It would be, would be difficult to discuss. But we decided to look at the same stuff, but this, this time looking at secondary product. And we, look, and we use uh, SCD BioAg. And again, right there, jackpot, you know, Autoinducers were, new, were wiped out completely, so in this situation, again, pathogens will find it harder to communicate. There will be less disease. So to wrap this up, all in all, what we found is that, well, Nareen and the rest of the team would probably want to do, want to look, maybe look at the, whether there's really some differences in quality between mother cultures. Who knows? But first of all, we know that probiotics have great potential for controlling the disease by means of controlling pathogen quorum sensing. And there is a couple really cool things about this quorum sensing stuff that I would like to go with you right now. First of all, when you control pathogens by means of controlling the quorum sensing, you keep them in check, but you don't kill them. How many of us have heard about superbugs or drug-resistant bacteria, drug-resistant this and that? This drug resistance arises because we use harsh chemicals to kill microbes, and what do they do? They become resistant. That's what they've been busy doing for the last 3 billion years. So, with quorum sensing, you can kind of bypass this, th this uh, resistance development. And um, by the way, there are scientists right, there are scientists who work on this stuff, and they, and they expect and they um, kind of predict that targeting quorum sensing for disease control is the strategy for the future, because most likely antibiotics and other chemicals will just start failing us more and more. So in the future, we'll need methods like targeting quorum sensing. And probiotics can already be involved in that, which is really great stuff. Another thing um, we want to remember about pathogenic microbes is that they, okay, they may, be, they may be dangerous, but many times they deliver very important functions in the environment. Some of them help releasing nutrients, some of them reduce some toxins, some of them, again, uh, team up with other microbes, in enhancing their efficiency. So many times you don't want to remove the pathogen, you just want to keep him in check. And this is what you can do by using quorum sensing. And the last thing about pathogens we want to remember, when they are in the environment, they at least protect the niche they are from other pathogens. So in other words, if you wipe out those pa the pathogen from a niche, some other pathogens can come in and start messing around, which is probably not what you really want to do. And this is a now longer way of saying that when you use quorum sensing for pathogen control, it's like playing with the diversity, with the nature, not against it. And probiotics can be involved in that, which is, which is really cool, I think. So that would wrap up our finding regarding quorum sensing. And um, 
and also wraps up our study number two. So let's go to overall summary of the stuff we went through today. So we found that probiotics may boost soil microbial diversity, and that could be that could be linked to better yields. And we also found that probiotics possess the potential to this to uh, interrupt microbial com pathogen communication, which can be used for, used for disease control. And these things, when combined all together, what, what do they mean? They mean that SCD probiotic technology has great potential. And guys, I want you to be aware of one thing that, I mean, I'm really proud of that research. I'm really happy that we found what we found, but this was just a graduate research. We basically just touched the surface of what the technology is, yet we found so much. So one would wonder how much more exciting things are there. And, um, how much more how much more stuff we could do and a personal message at the end from me in one month something like one month i will be going back to poland where i'll you know help my folks doing the business back there and i'm happy to be on this on this you know kind of global team that has an access to the technology like that because there's so much stuff we can do so many opportunities we can see and it will be will be good to just go back and, and do that and i wish you guys good luck with your endeavors and thanks a lot and if you have any questions Please let me know.